So years ago, my wife and I, we went to Hollywood, California, and we had this opportunity to go to the Dolby Theater in LA uh, to see a live taping of a TV show. You might have heard of it. It's called America's Got Talent. And the culture out there is just wild. Like, everybody and their mom is trying to get famous out there. Uh, everyone's just kind of hoping that they'll go viral. So when we were in the Dolby Theater, even the security guard just randomly broke out in the song. Like, he just started belting it in hopes that he would get discovered. It was wild. And the event was organized by a company called On Camera Audiences. That's who kind of puts this thing together. And the way that they seat for an audience, uh, the, the way they seat the audience for a show, rather, is that they would put the younger, kind of more attractive, trendy people towards the front, and then everyone else goes in the back, and if you're really bad, you're up on the balcony. That's kind of how they do it. Because, you know, if you're up in the front, you're more likely to get on camera, and you, you kind of want to fit their vibe and all of that. And so I had a secret weapon to get me up into the front and that was my wife, Danielle. So I let her go up there and get her tickets. I just kind of hung in the back. And, uh, and they did, they put us in the front, and we were sitting near like these Instagram influencers and people that were famous on YouTube. It was pretty cool. But the people on staff from on-camera audiences walked up to the people directly in front of us and said, you need to get up and go in the back right now. And they said, why, we just got here, we just sat down. They said, because Simon Cowell's wife wants to sit here and you can either get up and go in the back or we're gonna make you leave right now. I mean, they were so cold, they were so mean, they didn't give anyone the time of day. They treated us kind of like cattle, just moving us into this theater. But you should have seen how they treated the celebrities. Oh, can I get you something to drink? Are you hungry? Can I get you a snack? Oh, I just love your hair. Oh, you're so amazing. Oh, I'm such a big fan. And they'd laugh over the top at everything they'd say, meanwhile treating everyone else like dirt. Could you imagine if church was like that? Like from now on, we're going to have ushers that seat you according to your level of attractiveness and social status and how much money you have. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but there's stuff like that that actually exists in churches today. That same weekend when we were in California, I, I visited a mega church because I, I just never been to one before, and I wanted to see what the hype was about. And they kind of had the same mindset, had the same feel as being in the Dolby Theater. They actually had VIP seating that was reserved for the celebrities and famous athletes. And there was a class system there. There were actually certain parts of the church that you couldn't go to unless you were like VIP status. Even the pastor would walk through a back door, escorted by bodyguards, come up and preach, and then leave out the same door and not talk to anybody. And I, I, that just blew my mind. I've seen that in other places and other ways within churches. You know, there was a, a group, like a network of youth pastors in the area that would meet, and there was a lot of them. And, and so I went to a meeting, I was invited, and the first question when I walked in was not, what's my name? It was, how many kids are in your youth group? And now, I know like some of you, you don't know like in youth ministry just what kind of question that is. It's got a terrible motive attached. So I know this isn't honest, but I always answer five. I'll always say five, small group, just to see. And when I said five, they rolled their eyes. Nobody talked to me. It was like I was a ghost. And then they were looking at my, I, I guess the youth group social media, and they saw that on average we were having about 60 teens a week. And then when they found that out, boom, here they are. They want to know me. They want to get advice. They want to get information. My value to them was determined based on the success in ministry. And this is not something new. This isn't an American thing. This has always been in the church, and James is not having it. He's calling it out today. And so far, James has been talking about what is the, the test of a, tr a true mature believer. And the first test is, how do you go through trials? Right? You don't give up. You don't lose your joy. The next is that you resist temptation and you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The third is that you take God's word and you do something about it. You put it into practice in your daily life. And today, James lays out the fourth test, and that is how do you treat the people around you? Now, whether we want to admit it or not, we all do this. We all show favoritism in different ways. You might have a, a personal criteria for how you would determine somebody's value. You might look at someone and judge them right off the bat. It might be based on how they dress or the kind of car that they drive or how many letters come after their name or how many followers they have on social media or how much money is in their bank account. And where we left off last week, in that passage, the very last verse, it said this, keep yourselves from being polluted by the world. And one of the ways that we are polluted by the world is within the way that we judge people. And today, James is addressing it. 
It's gonna be a kind of a convicting message for all of us today. He's gonna help us kind of break out of this worldly thinking and help us to look at people around us through the eyes of Jesus. But before we start going verse by verse through this text, let's, let's pray together. Lord, you have a word for us today and we are here for it. We just wanna be in tune to you, Lord. I wanna thank you for bringing everybody here today and everyone who's watching online, Lord. We just wanna have this be a time to grow in our faith. We don't just wanna come here and hear your word and do nothing about it. We wanna leave here changed, Father. We wanna put it into practice in our lives. So convict us where you need to convict us, challenge us, and, and love us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. It starts off in verse one and it says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. There's a book that came out called Beauty Pays by Daniel Hammermesh, and it found that attractive students get more attention and higher grades from their teachers, that good-looking patients get more personalized care from their doctors, handsome criminals get lighter sentences than less attractive criminals, and attractive people make 11 to 15% more than unattractive people. I mean, how else do you think I got this gig here? <laughs> We all have biases, we do. We might even have people here that you're more likely to talk to than others. And let's just be honest, okay? If somebody, if you were talking to someone, you said, where are you from? And they said, oh, I'm from Irvington, or I'm from Newark, or I'm from Camden. You're gonna look at them a little different than if they said, I'm from Short Hills. I'm from Milburn, I'm from Westfield, I'm from Summit. But the same thing happened to Jesus. He was judged for his hometown. In John 1, Nathaniel said, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, what if someone said, can anything good come out of Irvington? Yeah, you better believe it. It is a sin to treat people like that because it's a command. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James brings up here. And Jesus illustrated this with the Good Samaritan, right? A Jew was beaten and robbed and left for dead, and his own people passed him by. But a Samaritan, an enemy, came along and showed him kindness and mercy. And this is what Jesus is saying is a good neighbor, someone that you love without a bias or favoritism. But this command of love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus commanded it, but then he elevated it. In John chapter 13, when he said, love one another as I have loved you. So now it gets kicked up a bit, right? This is a sacrificial love with no bias and with no exceptions. And so when Jesus died for your sins on the cross, he broke down the barriers that existed that separated people. You find this in Ephesians chapter two, it says that Jesus, broke down this wall of hostility that existed between Jew and Gentile. But even more than that, it applies to our culture. He broke down the wall of race and social class and nationalities and ethnicities that we are all one under Christ. Now, if you go to Mark chapter 12, there's this story that I love that Jesus and his disciples are sitting, sitting in the synagogue across from where people give their tithes. So across from the offering box. And Back in that culture, in the synagogue, the offering was a wooden box, and it had trumpet-shaped kind of bronze funnels. And the reason for this was when you gave your money, it would actually make a sound, you know, the coins hitting against the metal. And so everyone could hear how much money you gave, right? So, so people would come in ready for that with like a, a bag of coins and just dump their wealth in, and everyone could hear it because it would make this big, loud sound, and everyone would go, wow, look at how generous they are. And then in walks this poor widow who reached into her little purse and pulled out two coins, just a couple cents, and just clink, just a tiny little sound. Everyone probably rolled their eyes at her. And Jesus said, she gave more than everybody else. And the disciples are confused, like, what do you mean? She gave barely anything at all. And Jesus said, all these people gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty, meaning that was her grocery money. That was all she had to live on in the moment. You know, when you look at that story, even if she gave half, that would be impressive, but she gave it all, and nobody cared. People look down on her because they look at the outward appearance, but Jesus sees the heart. It's kind of like when you're at the coffee shop, and then they flip the screen over, and there's that little tip screen. You know, you see that everywhere. I'm gonna be honest. I'm only gonna give a good tip if they're watching me. I am a guilt tipper, for sure. But I want to set the record straight, you know, when it comes to tithing. I know we don't talk about this a lot, but it's not about the amount that you give. Don't be hung up on that kind of stuff. It is your heart. It's a form of worship. Are you doing it to be seen? I hope not. Just do it to worship God. And it's the same if you get involved with ministry here. Are you doing it to be seen and just to get to work? What is your motive? Or how much you give? It's about your heart that's behind it. 
Now, Pastor Tom told me this story that we used to have millionaires in church, and they were very wealthy, they were very generous as well, and the problem was that they would give very large amounts of money, and they thought since they gave a lot that they run the show, right? And so if God was leading this church in a direction they didn't like, they would say, I want that changed immediately. And if there was any pushback, they'd say, well, don't you know how much money I give to this church? I guess you don't want any more of my money. And that worked for a while, it worked. And then they brought in Pastor Tom, and he said, I don't wanna know what anybody gives. No pastor should know what anyone gives. And he ministered to everybody equally because he said, money doesn't rule here, Jesus does. And some of them left and he was okay with that. It has nothing to do with how much you give, but your heart of worship behind it. Don't worry about your outward appearance. We can't judge people for that. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is walking through the city of Jericho and all the people gathered around to meet him and there's this little guy named Zacchaeus. You know, whenever I bring up Zacchaeus, I always picture Danny DeVito. You know, just like four foot, I just picture Danny DeVito. Anyway, he was the equivalent of a mob boss in town. He was a chief tax collector, a Jew working for the Romans and he ripped everybody off. Right? He profited from stealing from his own people that he betrayed. And he couldn't see over this massive crowd, so he climbed a sycamore tree. And Jesus walks through the city, and out of everyone there, he singles out Zacchaeus. He looks up the tree and says, Zacchaeus, get down here. I'm coming over your house for lunch today. By the way, that is a biblical basis for inviting yourself over for lunch. All right, you could just walk up to someone in church today and say, hey, I'm coming over your house to eat today, because that's what Jesus did, all right? Now, when Jesus said that, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over. The whole city grumbled. They were angry, and they thought, Jesus is a fake. He's just trying to get rich. He's trying to get something from him. He's in it for the money. He's not the Messiah. And then Zacchaeus says this, I am returning everything that I stole from these people, and I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor. That's how you know he was born again. He's giving the money back, and that is why we need Jesus to break through to the IRS, right? Give that money. Can I say that? Okay. Okay. We might be so quick to judge others on their appearance or their status or their reputation, but Jesus sees the heart. You know, in college, uh, there was this guy in our dorm, and I say this with love and respect, he's such a nerd, all right? He's a self-proclaimed nerd, and he was very socially awkward. He dressed funny, you know, he would wear his pants like above his belly button, you know? He was really goofy, and he's the kind of kid who would knock on your door holding a board game and a DVD, and he'd go, you wanna play a game and watch a movie? Like, that's exactly how he talked. And I gotta tell you, you know, he was picked on a lot in his life. He was such a great friend. I don't think I've ever met anyone who loves Jesus more than him. He had a heart of gold. And I would never hang out with a kid like that in high school because I cared too much about, you know, image. And how dumb is that, that we care about those things? I'm so thankful to call him a friend. He really helped me a lot spiritually throughout college. In Acts chapter 10, Peter kind of has a similar awakening where he realizes, I have to get rid of this bias I have towards the Gentiles. God was calling Peter to visit a guy named Cornelius, and Peter says, well, it's not right for me, a Jew, to associate with a, a common Gentile. But when Cornelius and his family got saved, Peter comes to his senses and he realizes, I can't think like this anymore. I have to stop showing this bias and, and favoritism. You know, if anyone had the right to be a celebrity, right, and have celebrity status, it would have been Jesus, the king coming into the world. But look at Philippians 2. It says, Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he humbled himself and became a servant. And he dwelt among the people who were on the margins of society. He spent time with the outcasts or the losers, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, the people that broke his heart the most. And the Pharisees walked around with their noses in the air. We know Christians like this, right? Thinking they're better than everybody else and want to judge everyone. And they scoffed at Jesus and said, how could you associate with those wretched people? And he's like, associate? I came for them. These are the people I'm here for, not the righteous. You don't need me. And they made fun of him. They mocked him and they called him the friend of sinners. But he wore that like a badge of honor. In verse two, James gives us this illustration or this example that was likely to happen in their church and it's likely to happen in our church in a different way. It says, suppose a man walks into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and then a poor man comes in with filthy old clothes 
And if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, if you look at this passage in the Greek, the word for meeting is actually the same that was used for synagogue. So the early Christians would meet kind of in the Am I on? Here we go. The, the men and women sat in different places. You know, they, the women would probably be up in the balcony and the men would be up towards the front. And then there would be like a special VIP seating for the important people. And so in walks the rich man wearing the gold rings and the fine clothes, presenting himself with all of his elegance. Now, rings were a common way that Romans would display their wealth. They actually had places in the city where you could rent these really elaborate rings to show off your wealth that you didn't have and then you could just return it. Did you know the same thing happens today? All the, people are just trying to flash their wealth. People are out here like leasing cars they could never afford just to portray a certain image, am I right? And the ushers trip over each other to try and greet him. Oh, welcome to church today. Oh, I love your outfit, where are you from? Let me know if you have any questions. And then they sit close by you know, during the service, and right after service, they run up, hey, do you want to come down to First Cup? Sit with me. Sit right here. Let me go get you some coffee and some breakfast. Let me serve you. Meanwhile, the poor man comes in, not so much as a hello, or a, you can't sit here. You have to sit in the back. Hmm. The problem wasn't that they were nice to the rich man. There was nothing wrong with that. The problem is how they treated the man who was poor. If they gave that poor man the same welcome, this wouldn't be an issue. But they treated him like he was worthless because of his poverty. They showed favoritism and cared more for the outward appearance than they did the heart. And they favored the rich man because they're hoping to get something from him. That's the whole point. You're being nice to the celebrities and the rich people because you're hoping it's going to you know, rain down on you somehow. I don't think we've ever had a celebrity walk into Crossroads before. You know, I don't think that'll ever happen, but could you imagine you're sitting here listening to a sermon and sitting right next to you, just in walks Taylor Swift, just sits right next to you. And then you look on the other side and there's like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. How would you react? Would you pull your phone out like, oh, it's a church selfie? Would you be like, can you sign my Bible? Like what? I don't know how you would react, but I would hope that you would treat them just like anybody else. And this is what James is saying, that there should be no favoritism here in our church. And my hope is that if for some reason any celebrity were to walk in here, they'd sit down here for worship or stand and, and they'd be like, wow, I'm just like a regular person here. There's only one VIP special guest that we give all praise and attention to and that's Jesus Christ. And we've come to worship him. He's the only one who's on our pedestal here at Crossroads. And that's why James begins this passage by saying, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus. Look at how he starts this. This is so intentional. The glorious Lord Jesus, meaning all glory belongs to him, and compared to God's glory, there's just us, and we're all equal. And if you're here today, and you're very wealthy, or you have this like massive following on social media, that's great, and I hope you use it for the glory of God, but let's set the record straight with respect. We don't need anything from you, right? We get everything we need from Jesus Christ. Our fulfillment and our satisfaction is from him alone. We chase him alone. And so I wonder, are there any people in your life that you're ignoring or that you look down on or you go out of your way to avoid? Because I want you to know that the people that we push aside are the ones that Jesus would be sitting down with and serving and showing them love and hospitality. And, and we might look at someone and say, they're not worth my time. And Jesus looks at them and says, they're worth dying for. In 8th century England, you actually had to have money to go to church. You had to buy a pew or you could rent a pew in order to attend a service. And John Wesley said, that's, that's not right. I'm going to go and preach to the poor people. And so he preached to the people who were working in the mines because they were so low class and so poor that they would never be allowed to sit in church. And so he preached to a crowd of thousands of people in an open field and their faces were black because they were working in the mines. And as they were preaching... The story goes that there would be white streaks coming down their faces as they cried hearing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God continued to use the Wesleyan revivals because they brought the gospel to people that the church and the world rejected. In the 1800s, there was a man, his name was John Booth, and he was kicked out of church. And the reason why, why is because he kept bringing in people who were poor and low class and even homeless to church. And so they kicked him out over it. 
And he said, fine, you wanna kick me out of church? I'll start my own. And that led to the birth of the Salvation Army, reaching out to many who are in need. And my desire for us as a church is that we wouldn't look at our social status or our incomes, or our cars, our homes, our education, our age, or ethnicity, but we would look at one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, all in the same family of God. Not showing favoritism, but knowing that each and every one of us here is precious in the eyes of God, no matter what the world says. Now, it just makes me think of my grandfather. My grandfather was old school Berkeley Heights Italian, just like straight up meatballs and sauce. Like my grandpa, Old school, he's like a, he was a firefighter, a war veteran, just the man, legend. And when he came to Christ, God was doing this work in his heart. He just became a different guy. And towards the end of his life, I picked him up, and uh, we were driving along to this event, and we're driving through the town, and I said, how's life in Berkeley Heights these days, Grandpa? And he goes, Andy, this town is changing. We have a Chinese family moved in next door, and we got a black family moved in across the street. And I go, oh, no, here we go. And he said, and they're so wonderful, and I'm so glad they're here. Some of the great people, greatest people I've met. Listen, if you're here today and you have a bias, or you have a, a problem where you're showing favoritism to people, and you want to break out of it, and you're not sure where to start, I'll tell you, the answer is Jesus Christ and intimacy with him. Let him do this work in your heart and break you out of this thinking by reading his word and spending time in prayer and saying, God, I need you to remove this. And when you come to this next section in James, I, I think this is so cool because James in this part of the text explains why you need to do this. And I love this. He doesn't just say, hey, you need to do this. He says, and here's why. It's not just a because I said so kind of a text. He explains that it's so important to show mercy. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. You know, some commands from God, they just go down easy. It's like ice cream, like, ooh, I like that. And other commands are like broccoli. Like, you just gotta, you just gotta fight through that. And James is saying, you don't get the right to choose which commands you like and which ones you don't, which commands you're gonna follow and which ones you throw away. You can't be like, all right, so like I committed adultery, but I didn't kill anybody. No, if you sin, you sin. Like this is treason against God. We're all on a level playing field here. There's no perfect people here. Like I keep saying, if you're a perfect person, you gotta let me know. I gotta find you a perfect church. This, this ain't it. Verse 12, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now that's a powerful text. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says that one day we will stand before God in judgment. And you might be like, whoa, 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 Andy, hold on, man. I thought I was forgiven. I thought there was grace. Like, why am I being judged? Now, it's not the same as the white throne judgment. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, you are covered by grace, but you still need to give an account for your life. And what this passage is saying is that the way that we spend our time here on earth matters to God. The way that you spend your time, the way that you spend your God-given gifts and talents and abilities, that's important to him. And in verse 13, James makes it clear. He says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Now, this same truth is mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. It says, the standard of judgment that you use to judge other people will be used to judge you. Now, here's what that means. If you take out your little teaspoon and you give out like a little teaspoon of mercy to certain people and you expect a dump truck of mercy from God on you, what God is saying is if you pull out that teaspoon for other people, I'm pulling out the teaspoon on you. And that's a powerful thing to think about with the way we treat people. It reminds me of 1 John chapter 3. It says that if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Meaning instead of judging or mocking someone who's struggling, you know what we could do? We could help them. We have people even here in the church that are struggling financially, and we can't overlook that. We need to help people. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, I feel so compelled to give to someone who's in need, and, and I want to be anonymous, here's the way you do it. We have a benevolence fund here in church. I love this. Every dollar from this fund just goes to helping people that can't afford their groceries, or they have a big medical bill they can't afford, or they're going to lose their mortgage, or, or, or they're struggling. That's what we have it for. And if you want to give to that fund, you're welcome to do it. But if you want to receive from that fund, we're here for you. But it doesn't just have to be here in the church. Don't limit yourself to crossroads. Find a charity that's doing God's work to help the, the less fortunate around the world and give. Give what you can, but, but let it be from your heart. You might be here today 
and you're a victim of judgment, and you're a victim of favoritism. You might have grown up in a household where your parents always showed favoritism to one sibling over you. You might have been judged for your race or for your age. You might have been overlooked and underestimated. And you know what the root of that discrimination is? It's, it's pride. And I want you to know, if that's you, that I know this is gonna sound like a bummer, but Jesus isn't impressed with you. He's not impressed with your net worth. He's not impressed with your clothes or your education or your accomplishments or your appearance. If God was impressed with you, you'd have to keep it up. You'd have to keep performing all the time. He's not impressed with you, but he loves you. And so in the moments when you fail and you feel the weight of your shame and your guilt, Jesus comes to forgive and to restore. And when he looks at you, he sees his child, that you really are precious to him and made in his image. And anyone who's going to come along and toss you aside, I think they're missing out because God is doing a work in your life. And it's not worth your time chasing after their approval. Who cares what these people think about you if you know that you are loved by God? Amen? You know, when I was in California, I was waiting in line with Danielle that day in the Dolby Theater for America's Got Talent. We're all excited and we're standing in line and right in front of us is this 11-year-old boy waiting to get in with his mom. And he was so loud, and he was so flamboyant, and he just started singing and dancing. He was like a diva, and he was just super obnoxious. And he says to his mom this, one day, everyone's gonna line up just like this to see me. And, and on the me, he did a split, all right? So one day, everyone's gonna line up just like this to see me. It was so obnoxious. And he gets up, and his mom turns to him and gets to his level, and, and puts her hands on his shoulders and says, honey, and I'm like, yes, please tell this kid to stop. He's so obnoxious. And she said, one day, your name will be. One day, my name will be in lights. He just was so excited. I'm thinking, no! Why would you do that to him? There are so many people in this world that are trying to go viral, they're trying to get discovered, they're trying to be famous, but look at what's happening in the world. There are wars and famine and diseases and right outside that theater on every street corner were homeless people with their hands out begging for food. What good is it for your name to be in lights, kid? What good is it for my name to be in lights? What good is my vanity when it only serves me? We need to put the name of Jesus in lights. We need to make sure that he is famous because Jesus is the only source of hope and healing in this dark and broken world. People don't need more of us, they need more of him. And we can look at someone, right? We can look at someone that annoys us and we roll our eyes and we say, oh, you gotta be kidding me. We write people off left and right. Oh, I don't want anything to do with you. They need Christ and you don't get to pick and choose who gets to hear the gospel and who doesn't based on how you feel about that. And so I wanna challenge you as we end today. Is there anyone in your life that you walk past and you don't think twice about them? Is there anyone that you maybe even go out of your way to avoid is there anyone that you've judged in your life even though you've never even gotten to know them? Maybe even it's people here at church that you would never normally talk to and you could walk up to someone you don't normally talk to and say hi. Step outside your comfort zone. Share the love of Jesus this week with at least one person who would least expect it from you. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we are just so greatly influenced by our culture that we live in. We've been trained incorrectly on how to determine worth. We need to see people through your eyes. Help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we could see people the way that you see them and love people the way that you love them. Lord, we need less of us, less of our agenda, less of our perspective and more of you, more of your grace, more of your mercy, more of your compassion and your great love. Lord, I pray that as we go out into our lives and into our routines, help us to look for ways to reach the lost. Love the forgotten. God, would you help us to break out of these biases and see people through the lens of Christ? We need you because we can't do this on our own. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.